Welcome, and uh, thank you very much for braving the storm and coming out tonight to hear Scott Turow. We are really privileged to welcome him through the generosity of the John William Proctor Distinguished Visiting Author Endowment. And I thought I'd say a couple of words about Bill Proctor um, before Mike gives a proper introduction. Bill Proctor served in World War II and he completed his master's and PhD here at, at the University of Missouri. He taught English here in Columbia and then he went on to the newly created UMSL as well as New Mexico State at Las Cruces and then Northern State College in Aberdeen, South Dakota and then he retired here in Columbia. After his death in 1998, Bill's family felt that a suitable memorial of his love of the spoken and written language would be to help bring to Columbia distinguished authors to meet students and faculty and the people of Columbia. We are grateful to Mary Proctor C. and her children, Andrew C. and Susan Strongman, for their continued generosity. Mike Petrick's going to give a proper introduction, but I thought I'd say a couple of words first. Uh, Scott went to the writing program at Stanford um, in the early 70s, around the time I was finishing my PhD there. And then he was the Jones lecturer for two or three years after that. The one story about Scott Turow that I heard in those days among our gossiping mutual buddies, and the thing that impressed me the most about him was that he had decided at some point late in his career there at Stanford to hell with this writing stuff. He was going to law school <laughs> and have a real profession. The only problem was that he then wrote a book about the first year of law school called 1L, which was not just a bestseller but which has become a classic. So he was pulled back down into the grime of writing, <laughs> as well as being a crusading prosecutor and lawyer and writer. More recently, and many of you already know this, Scott has gone on to a third profession. He sings <laughs> with a group of equally talented musicians called the Rock Bottom Remainders. <laughs> he puts on a fright wig and really goes to town with Wild Thing. You can watch it on YouTube. Other people in the band include Dave Berry, Roy Blunt, Stephen King, Amy Tan, and several other poor writers trying to supplement their writing with a little outside income. <laughs> Mike, come give a proper introduction. Thanks, Fear. So not only does Scott Turow have a burgeoning music career, um, but as Spear mentioned, he's also done a bit of writing in his time. Um, Mr. Turow has, in fact, written nine best-selling works of fiction, including his first novel, Presumed Innocent, and its sequel, Innocent. He's also published numerous works of nonfiction, including the books One L, which Spear mentioned, and Ultimate Punishment, a reflection on the death penalty. And he's also written many essays and op-ed pieces published all over the place in places like New York Times, the Washington Post, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, Playboy, and The Atlantic. So some pretty big names there. Um, some of the literary awards he has won include the Heartland Prize in 2003 for Reversible Errors, the Robert F. Kennedy Book Award in 2004 for Ultimate Punishment, and Time Magazine's Best Work of Fiction in 1999 for Personal Injuries. I should also note that while having such success at writing, Mr. Turow continues to work as an attorney, and this unique perspective supplies his prose with an original and engaging voice that he's sustained over the course of his career. Please join me in welcoming the John William Proctor Distinguished Author for 2012, Mr. Scott Turow. Well, there, there is clearly a level of hardihood in Columbia that uh, is lacked elsewhere in the country. I'm, uh, <clears throat> thank you all <clears throat> for coming out on such a lousy uh, evening, um, and uh, I'm, I'm doubly grateful to be here. Um, thank you, Mike, for that, uh, that introduction, and Spear. 
uh, for those kind words. The, uh, the rock bottom remainders, um, uh, actually, uh, we're, I think we're headed uh, sort of uh, like many other uh, rock groups of our vintage before us. Uh, for our first of what undoubtedly will be many farewell concerts uh, <laughs> in June. Uh, as for my role uh, in the Rock Bottom Remainders, I always say that uh, you know uh, that you're in trouble when you are in a musical group as a sight gag. And uh, I, I, very, I very surely am. Uh, some of the people in the band, um, like my friend Steve King, uh, are not really great musicians, but compared to me, Stephen King is Beethoven. <laughs> so, anyway, I, I wanted to um, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, and read a little bit, uh, and I sort of thought, um, you know, every now and then, looking at somebody like Spear, whom I've known now for 40 years, solid. Uh, I sit, I kind of sit there and think, how in the world did I get this lucky? And, uh, you know, to end up, uh, you know, coming someplace as a, as a lecturer and reader in a lecture series so distinguished. Um, and it is luck, and I'll be the, the first to acknowledge that. Um, so we'll spear privately, I'm sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, my, my course to becoming a novelist, as even the brief biographical notes indicated, was somewhat tortuous. Uh, I arrived at Amherst College in 1966, uh, conceived of the int intense ambition uh, to be a novelist. And uh, I actually uh, was, I suddenly realized there was a, a Mizzou connection to my going to Amherst, if you can believe it because um, my parents were friendly with the only, the only novelist I knew uh, was by sort of transitivity because uh, my parents were friends of friends of Bruce J. Friedman. And uh, Bruce was a graduate of the University of Missouri. Uh, and uh, so I read his books. And in one of the books he talked about a quote, tough little guy from Bates. And that seemed like a description that, you know, I could aspire to. And, uh, but I had no idea what Bates was. Uh, and uh, because I wanted to find out what Bates was, I found out about the world of little liberal arts colleges. And having gone to a high school of 5,000, a little liberal arts college sounded good to me. So it's sort of a nod to Bruce that I, I ended up at Amherst College. Um, what I had not noticed in this, you know, very careful and searching uh, uh, decision on my educational path was that uh, Amherst College had no such thing in those days as creative writing. Uh, it was regarded as the intellectual equivalent of basket weaving. Um, and at that point, the uh, Amherst English Department was presided over uh, by a man named Theodore Baird. And, uh, Baird, uh, despite his role at, at Amherst, will always be best remembered to literary posterity as, as Robert Frost's best friend. Uh, and uh, Frost also had taught at Amherst at one point. And of course, people who know a lot about Frost always find this shocking because they thought Frost had no friends at all. Uh, <laughs> but Baird was one of the few that he had. And he was, um, Baird, uh, was sort of the chief proponent of a critical approach called the New Criticism. <clears throat> and the New Criticism provided that, um, that the only thing that matter uh, in either learning to write or interpreting a literary work are the words on the page. Uh, and therefore, history doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't matter if the A-bomb went off outside the poet's window. Uh, biography doesn't matter, doesn't matter if the novelist was a cross-dresser raised in a cage. Uh, the only thing you need to know in interpreting the literary work are the words uh, that are on the page. And uh, in order to make this point to his student, and I, uh, since there was no alternative, enrolled in English classes, and uh, the first day of class, Baird would walk in and he would hold up a yellow lead pencil and he would say to the first young man, and it was all young men in those days, uh, 
what is it? And the young man, of course, being you know the brilliant type, uh, would say, it's pencil, professor, at which point Baird would walk over and hit him in the head with it. <laughs> and he would then go to the second young man, and he would say, what is it? And the second, second young man would say, it's a long yellow object, whack. Whack, 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 all the way around the class till he'd hit all 15 of his students, at which point he would say, it's a weapon. <laughs> He would then walk to the window, point at it and say, what is it? And the first young man would cower under his student desk and from that distance answer, uh, it's a window, professor. And Baird would say, no, it's an exit. And he would then lift the sash, step over, and be gone for the <laughs> remainder of the first class period. Now, the, the lesson that a single word can change uh, our perceptions of an ordinary object uh, is, of course, a powerful one uh, which has stayed with me forever in my life, both uh, as uh, a writer and as a lawyer. Uh, but it did not really teach me how to be a novelist. Um, and, uh, you know, my, my ambition to be a novelist, I have to admit, um, uh, came from my mom. And uh, my mom always wanted to be a novelist. Uh, unfortunately for me, she really didn't get around to doing it much. Uh, and uh, so there wasn't much of an example at home. I wasn't able to talk about what it was like to write a novel uh, with my mother, much as, much as I loved and admired her. Um, so uh, finally, just in pure frustration, uh, at the, as my freshman year was winding to a close, I decided that uh, there was nothing else to do but write a novel. And of course, uh, much as I um, always speak uh, with great appreciation about creative writing programs, uh, I think as my friend uh, Nancy Packer, who was the director of the Writing Center during Spear in my years at Stanford, um, while you can't learn in a writing program how to make uh, a silk purse out of a sow's ear, you can make a silk purse out of silk. And uh, actually, if you stand back and look uh, at uh, American literature today, most of the people who've had uh, an impact uh, in the last two generations are all products of creative writing programs. So. Uh, I don't mean to down uh, creative writing programs, but of course, uh, in sitting down and actually writing a novel, I had struck upon uh, the still indispensable element, writers write, uh, and people who don't write aren't writers, and people who do are. Um, now, the novel I decided to write, um, I, I hadn't learned much in my freshman year at Amherst, but I certainly had learned to be pretentious. So, uh, and, uh, so this novel was called Dithyram, which is a Greek term, uh, the meaning of which I still no longer uh, precisely recall. But, um, and why I called it Dithyram, which has something to do with a Greek dance, uh, I really can't begin to tell you. But uh, anyway, it's about two young, boys from you know, the north side of Chicago run away, sort of like Huck and Jim, and follow the Mississippi and end up uh, in New Orleans where they witness the murder of an African-American prostitute in the, the bad old days of the South. And the plot, frankly, when I recite it, does not sound that bad to me, um, even somewhat promising. But as I say, most of the novel was set in New Orleans, and I had never been to New Orleans. <laughs> which did not keep me from uh, sending this novel off to New York and was roundly rejected by a couple of dozen publishers. Uh, then in my uh, sophomore year, as the, as the rejection slips were raining down on me, um, my sort of uh, nascent interest in popular fiction um, sort of reared its head when my, my roommates were teasing me, of course, because I was getting rejection slips and Mickey Spillane, it turned out, uh, at that point uh, was the best-selling uh, novelist in the world. And, uh, you know, as I said, hadn't learned much. Pretension I'd learned, and I was like, oh, that, that's junk. Uh, I could write a book like that in three weeks. 
And uh, my roommates challenged me and was like, you know, yeah, what kind of novel could you write in three weeks? Well, it turned out that I had uh, the plot of a thriller uh, spinning around in my head. I'd been very active in the civil rights movement. Uh, and I thought what uh, the United States needed at that point in time was a black superhero. This, I have to say, in my, uh, in my own defense, was before the days of Shaft. And uh, my, my black superhero was going to be John Henry Steele, the protector, who was the son of a Lena Horne-like figure in a white industrial magnate. And he was going to run around protecting people and uh, every 25 pages or so having you know, prolonged bouts of sex. And uh, that part at least sounded pretty good to my roommates. And so they said they would uh, go to class for me for the next three weeks while uh, you know, they would outline my papers and I, I could write John Henry Steele, The Protector, and they would then, uh, they would then um, pay to have it professionally typed. Uh, and then I would send it to New York, and as you know, the riches descended from heaven, uh, we would split the profits four ways. Uh, and uh, of course, two of my roommates went on to become corporate lawyers. The third uh, ended up as the CEO and major shareholder of Northwest Airlines. And uh, I, re I realized in retrospect that I had been uh, history's first victim of a leveraged buyout. But <laughs> anyway, uh, John Henry Steele, the protector, was derailed by many factors, not the least of them, uh, the assassination that spring of Dr. Martin Luther King, which made it all the more preposterous for a young uh, white college student to be writing about a black anything. Uh, and uh, so uh, sort of out of desperation, I went back uh, to sort of writing more serious fiction. And uh, lo and behold, I went to Boston uh, in what would now be the spring of my junior year. And <clears throat> I had a blind date with a young woman who went to BU. Uh, I wish I could tell you her name. I don't recall it. Uh, I can remember the movie we saw, because we saw The Graduate. Uh, <laughs> but I don't remember her name. But I, she did tell me a story that affected me deeply. Uh, it was. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd never met anybody before who had been raped. And she described this to me in uh, what I thought was uh, both a really moving and uh, even keeled way. Um, she had survived the experience. And then went back to Amherst um, and uh, developed a fever. And when the fever broke, I got up and uh, in one sitting, of about 12 hours wrote what was eventually to become uh, my first published short story. Um, and uh, it does culminate in a rape. Um, it, it starts off somewhat more comically, so I thought I would read uh, that part to you. It's called A Classic Case. It was published in the Transatlantic Review. Again, I'm sure all of you literary scholars remember that the Transatlantic Review was originally started by uh, Ernest Hemingway and Ford Maddox Ford, and uh, it then went on tougher times and ended up publishing the likes of me. But uh, a classic case begins, Mrs. Dorothy Hamer, 52, thin-legged but sagging at the bosom in midriff, was one of the neighborhood ladies who enjoyed substitute teaching at Wilson High School once or twice a week. She said it kept her mind sharp. Occasionally, Ben Elias, Wilson's principal and Dorothy's neighbor, would prevail upon her as boss, plead with her as friend to take longer assignments. He'd done that yesterday when Thomas Gregory, a biology teacher, had demanded immediate transfer. Ben said he could talk someone into taking Gregory's chem and morning biology if Dorothy would handle the afternoon advanced placement bio for a week, 10 days. She taxied the mile to Wilson on a green spring afternoon and sat in the faculty lounge, sitting, sipping bitter black coffee as she read over Gregory's notes. She had been conned, of course, nothing new from Ben. The syllabus said, sex education, development, and practice, a unit required by state law. She could, she supposed, leave it for whomever would get there eventually, but Ben hadn't called her for nothing. She was stuck. The class would never let her get away with the change, so it was going to be she gaily scribbling penises all over the blackboard. She went to the classroom a moment before the first bell. 
If she didn't do the drawing in front of the class, they would all be more comfortable. She struggled, but when the students filed in behind the formica-topped lab tables, she had a reasonable facsimile of the male genitalia on the board. She used the no-nonsense smile as she looked them over. They were generally fine kids, handsome, well-kept, alert. Eddie Jasko, still not past the teacher's pet routine, was in the first row, looking earnest and eager and inert, and behind him something helper and whose parents ran the girdle shop. Harleen Spector's Marsha was even uglier than Harleen, and Parabitos, the crazy Greek, had, as usual, isolated himself in the back of the classroom, darkly handsome, almost beautiful, and fiercely stoic. She began sternly, telling them that they were mature young people, that it was time for them to have a full understanding of these things. She herself, she confided, believed strongly in sex education laws which assured that everyone had a firm knowledge before they went off to college. Now, this should give you a good insight to start. If we look back to the mode of locomotion in the mollusca, they giggled. Uh, like now, this portion of the penis produces an erection like the oyster's or clam's foot. It fills with fluid, blood, this blood sinus. There was some shuffling, laughter, and a muted scream behind her. Parabitos was on his feet in the back of the room giving a loping imitation of a gorilla. His arms hung bent as if on floating hinges, and he hunched himself over, belching out animal sounds each time he went up off the floor. Mrs. Hamer scowled and raised a hand to scold the boy, then emitted a tiny, frantic wheeze. An erect penis projected through Parabito's fly. The girls held frozen webs of fingers across their eyes. The boys sat rigidly. Eddie Jasko was on his feet. Now come on, rabbit, cut it out, cut it out. Parabitos bounded forward, leapt onto Eddie's desk, jumping and grunting. Eddie waved and turned away, but there was a chorus of shrill screams. The girls, all of them, were running, crowding through the door. Mrs. Hamer watched, watched the lithe figure bounce on the desktop, graceful, exact, balletic. Suddenly, he leaped toward her, thudding onto the front table. Cold rippled down her. She moaned, flailed once, then escaped down the hall, not far behind the covey of girls whining as they stampeded through the corridor. In Ben Elias's office, she went directly past his secretaries into the plush consultation room. She could only gasp, and Elias had to remove his bottle of sherry from the school safe. <laughs> Never again, Ben, she told him while he patted her hand. <laughs> So began my literary career. <laughs> um, by then, I was taking Professor Baird's Shakespeare class. And uh, Professor Baird, it was, this, this was long before the days of publish and perish. So uh, nobody in the English department published anything, let alone, <laughs> let alone a student. Uh, so this, this was somewhat uh, noteworthy. And uh, Professor Baird uh, surprised me by coming up to me one morning. In, in his Shakespeare class. By then, I was a senior. And he says, I read your short story last night. It's not bad. And you're such a harmless looking little fellow. So with encouragement uh, like that, I, I had to go on and go on, I did. And uh, as Spear mentions, I was lucky enough to become a writing fellow uh, at Stanford. and. Uh, there, um, you know, I, it, it was a, an amazing time to arrive on the west coast of the United States. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try, I'm, this, is, this is my first effort ever at a technological reading. And we'll see if it actually succeeds. Um, so far, not. But... Uh, <laughs> But I think I, can, I think I can do this if you'll forgive me for, for concentrating on this. Um, I've got to hold it this way so I can get to the right page. All right. Um, and this is, this is from a, a novel called The Laws of Our Fathers that I wrote uh, a number of years later. Uh, but it was my effort to come uh, to come to terms with the 60s. And uh, this is sort of a description of what those who were there uh, will recognize more as Berkeley 
uh, than Palo Alto. Entering the town of Damon, California was much like crossing a national border. I just turned this thing. Um, Entering the town of Damon, California was much like crossing a national border. Beyond the campus environs dwelled men who looked as if they had gotten their haircuts in pencil sharpeners and women in girdles. But here along Damon's main drag, Campus Boulevard, the culture of the young flourished in a tumbling, bizarre atmosphere. The town's transient elements, students and street freaks, hippies, home runaways, and communards, now far, far outnumbered the indigenous residents, the faculty families, and various grumpy Latinos who had watched as Campus Bowl sprawled surrounding the bookstores and student hangouts and mercados with head shops, candle stores, and the new boutiques vending tie-dyed dresses and garments of macrame. The traffic, thick at all hours with touring gawkers, staggered by while street performers, mimes, and bongo drummers, and gentle pipers did their things, and the Damonites, in leisure suits and floral granny gowns, strolled the avenue among the soiled barefoot hippies, each one inevitably accompanied by a mongrel dog leashed on a piece of string. On the building signs, the trisected peace sign was spray painted while harsher words praised the NLF in Vietnam and Huey Newton, then in jail for supposedly killing a police officer. Appearing often amidst the graffiti in day glow shades was a round lettered injunction which simply urged, be free. Arriving with my girlfriend, I found all of this, the commotion, the array, the slogans, inspiring. I could feel the life of my generation, historical, dynamic, epical, like a rush flowing through my arms. This was the bold new world, its shape as yet uncertain, but sure to be better than the one our parents had given us. Fair enough. Uh, it's kind of the way I felt um, arriving uh, in the Bay Area in, uh, in the fall of 1970. And uh, the five years I spent at Stanford, of course, had an, an immense um, impact on me. And they were, they were good years, uh, and they were bad years. Uh, the good years was that I was surrounded by many talented young writers. Uh, and just by being in their company, I had greater faith in my own ability to follow uh, my own dreams. Uh, but there were, of course, you know, discordant elements. Um, as I like to say, um, while not all the young writers uh, wrote like Ernest Hemingway, they surely all drank like Ernest Hemingway. <laughs> so they were, they were years of, of frequent dissipation. Uh, and the, tr the truth is that my writing uh, was not going particularly well, although in many ways, I look back at the novel that I was working on then and see it as a kind of uh, turning point in my career. Um, that novel uh, was called The Way Things Are. And uh, actually, the, the book I just read from, The Laws of Our Fathers, uh, is sort of uh, seeded here and there with some of the uh, passages that I rescued from The Way Things Are many years later. Um, the Way Things Are um, was about a rent strike on the north side of Chicago. And, sort of like Dithramb and other efforts before and, uh, and after, uh, it was widely rejected by many uh, New York publishers. And uh, the reason it was widely rejected by many New York publishers was that the plot hinged on something called the implied warranty of habitability, which I was to discover was not the secret ingredient for bestsellerdom. <laughs> and, um, the implied warranty of habitability was, in fact, a legal doctrine that was being uh, imported into American law. I found the dynamic processes of American law uh, quite fascinating. And while the novel uh, never saw the light of day, uh, I eventually began to realize that, much to my amazement, um, I found the law quite interesting. Uh, this was a shock, because my dad was a physician. And uh, my father, I always say, was a prophet in his own time, in the sense that he was a doctor who hated lawyers long before it was fashionable for doctors <laughs> to do that. 
So I, I literally grew up knowing no lawyers, and when all of my college roommates had gone off to law school, I was shocked to find that uh, what they did, especially the ones who were working uh, as young prosecutors, uh, I found what they were doing uh, really intriguing. And so the thought began to dawn on me um, of uh, going to law school and ending uh, my very, very young uh, academic career. Um, and there were many reasons that I, I wanted to make that change. Um, none of them, frankly, had to do with um, the idea of making a living, because I hadn't you know, come to any sense of reality about that. Um, I, I did realize that academic life was not for me, uh, particularly the politics of it. Um, I had been involved on a search committee uh, in which even months later the members of the committee were still picking little bits of gore out of their hair. Um, in the course of that I learned, of course, the, the, the two uh, frequent sayings about academic life. Number one, the problem with intellectuals is that they think ideas are important. Uh, number two, academic politics are rough because there is so little at stake. Um, <laughs> M much more, though, uh, than my enjoyment or lack of enjoyment with academic life was that um, some, I knew something was wrong with my writing. I, I felt tremendous pressure. All of the great expectations, which I now look back and say that um, had something to do with my upbringing and you know, my relationship with my mom, um, all those great expectations just seemed to weigh me down. and. Uh, I, I sort of wanted to write my way to greatness. And at the age of 22 or 23, 24, uh, you're not going to do that. Uh, and, and yet I was kind of desperate. And I found that my desire to write about my experience was actually standing between me and my experience. And I don't remember the name of that bar in Palo Alto, Spear, but I remember Asleep at the Wheel used to appear there now and then. And I'm sitting there uh, having a beer with, uh, with a mutual friend of ours, Chuck Kinder, and I realize I'm not listening to what he's saying. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to describe the disk of light on the top of his beer glass. And, and literally, at that moment, I realized that I was doing something wrong uh, and that uh, I, I had to get out of there. Uh, I had to get away uh, from a life in which uh, I was always going to be thinking about that and sort of live. Um, now, there were, I took the LSAT. I was not a great standardized test taker, except in that one instance. And, you know, I did fabulously on that test. So, you know, I could sort of pick my law school. Uh, and uh, I, the, the biggest crisis I faced then, after I told my colleagues in the English department who, just literally couldn't believe it. I mean, this is the, this is by now the early 1970s, but the 60s are still not over, um, and you know nobody can believe that I was, as one of them put it to me, becoming the chainmail fist of the ruling class. Um, <laughs> but once I had surmounted that crisis, um, I had the bigger task ahead of me, which was explaining to my literary agent who had. Um, dragged the way things are all over New York that I was, um, that I was going to uh, go to law school. And uh, my dealings with my literary agent, she was a famous literary agent, uh, but they were difficult because it was still the days of the three martini lunch in, uh, in Manhattan. And uh, so she'd go off to lunch and have her three martinis. As I, as I mentioned, um, I was leading my own dissipated life uh, with the young writer, so I was rarely up before nine. So I couldn't get to her until she'd had the three martinis. And when she got back to the office, I couldn't understand a word she'd said. <laughs> so I decided what I would do is write her a letter. And uh, in the course of writing the letter, literally the idea came to me as I'm sitting there. Uh, I, and it's re it was really intended as a sop to her. And I said, you know, it really would be a great idea if some a uh, young writer who was going to law school would write a book about the experience of being a law student because I hadn't found anything like that. And uh, 
I really was not thinking that young writer would be me because I, after all, was a novelist. I was an artiste. This was nonfiction I was talking about. Uh, but, you know, in the just symptomatic of the relationship, she didn't understand that uh, and went out to uh, lunch with a man named Ned Chase. Now, Ned, uh, who's now of blessed memory, was a a uh, great figure in the New York literary world, uh, at one point the president of Times Books, at that point a senior editor at Putnam's. Um, but Ned, a little bit like Professor Baird, will always be best remembered for another reason. In his case, it's because he is the father of Chevy Chase. Uh, and uh, having met both men, I can tell you it is purely genetic. Um, and Ned was every bit as zany as his son. So he goes out to lunch with uh, my literary agent, and uh, they have the obligatory three martinis, and it starts to rain, sort of, as it's raining here in Columbia tonight. And uh, so they decide, rather than go out in the rain, it'd be a good idea to have a bottle of wine. Uh, and then they steep keeps raining, so it must be a sign from the heavens that they have a second bottle of wine. <laughs> And by the time they feel, finish the second bottle of wine, it's drawing on to 5 o'clock, and they both agree there is not a good idea for a book anywhere in the city of New York, at which point my agent remembers that she's got my letter in her purse. And she takes it out, Ned reads it, neither one of them notices that I'm not proposing to write this book. And so uh, he decides it's great, signs a contract on the spot, sends it to me. I'm living up in San Francisco at that point. Uh, and, you know, here it is. I could literally paper this railroad flat in rejection slips. Uh, and now I've decided to go to law school, and here I am with a book contract. And <laughs> to say that the ironies were sabering uh, is an understatement. I will always remember, you know, standing there on the front steps uh, at 22 Fair Oaks in San Francisco. But, uh, I have, not only was it a book contract, it was a contract for a book I had never really proposed to write. Uh, but uh, so much for that, I went in, I signed the contract, and went off, uh, as I say, to go to Harvard Law School uh, to make new friends and to write about them. Uh, and, uh, and, and that is what I did. Um, and I kept a journal in my first year uh, of uh, my time at Harvard Law School. And uh, I just did a new um, introduction to 1L. And of course, with the great distance of time, uh, it's sort of amazing to me that a book that I started writing uh, in 1975 is still in print and still, uh, and still being read. And uh, law school's changed a lot. Uh, even Harvard Law School has finally changed a lot, due thanks mostly to Elena Kagan, um, who was a great dean there. And, um, so I, what I, my own theory is this has got to be about more than the mechanics about, of law school. And I think 1L is a book about identity, um, which, well, it should have been, because I, of course, was in great conflict about my own. Um, was I a writer? Was I a lawyer? Why was I making this transition? Um, you know, I, I was just teeming with the kinds of questions that people frequently are teeming with at the age of 25. Uh, but uh, as often happens. That was clearly good for the book. Um, so 1L uh, begins as follows. Uh, November 17th, 1975. It is Monday morning, and when I walk into the central building, I can feel my stomach clench. For the next five days, I will assume that I am somewhat less intelligent than anyone around me. At most moments, I'll suspect that the privilege I enjoy was conferred as some kind of peculiar hoax. I will be certain that no matter what I do, I will not do it well enough. And when I fail, I know that I will burn with shame. By Friday, my nerves will be so brittle from sleeplessness and pressure and intellectual fatigue that I will not be certain I can make it through the day. After years off, I have begun to smoke cigarettes again. Lately, I seem to be drinking a little every night. I do not have the time to read a novel or a magazine, and I am so far removed from the news of world events that I often feel as if I've fallen off the dark side of the planet. I am distracted at most times and have difficulty keeping up a conversation, even with my wife. 
At random instants, I am likely to be stricken with acute feelings of panic, desperation, indefinite need, and the pep talks and irony I practice on myself only seem to make it worse. I am a law student in my first year at the law, and there are many moments when I am simply a mess. Um, it was amusing to me uh, when 1L was published in 1975. Most of you won't be able to see this, but um, the uh, publisher Putnam's appropriated the Harvard Law School crest uh, with its three sheaves of wheat. The, the student joke being, of course, that there were three sheaves in order to remind us that the lawyer always gets a third. Um, <laughs> It's also an act of, uh, of intellectual property uh, piracy that would no longer uh, be tolerated. Um, 1L uh, came out during my third year at, at Harvard Law School. Um, and uh, people always say, well, why did you publish that during your third year uh, when you were still in school? Because it was nonfiction. I changed names to protect the guilty, as it were. But everybody, everybody knew who they were. Uh, and uh, the people who thought that they had been favorably portrayed thought that 1L uh, was, a, um, was a distinguished uh, and discerning literary work. Those who did not think they were as favorably portrayed uh, had other opinions. Uh, ch chief among them uh, was uh, the first year professor whom uh, I had changed his name to Perini. I called him Rudolph Perini. And Perini was portrayed as a brutal utilizer of the Socratic method of classroom uh, interrogation. And, uh, you know, 1L took off um, and uh, did really well, especially for a first book. And uh, as it gained attention in, you know, the New York Times and Newsweek and uh, this professor became more and more agitated, uh, and finally he called a news conference and announced that he was Perini and he was madder than hell about it. Uh, <laughs> but but how, how mad he was, I didn't fully appreciate until the end of what was then my uh, first term in my third year at Harvard Law School, uh, when uh, a friend came running uh, with the exam booklet from this particular professor's copyright class, and the last question on the exam went something like this. You are an associate in a large law firm. A senior partner has introduced you to his valued client, Professor Rudolph Perini. <laughs> Professor Perini has undergone the humiliating experience of having a student, Ray Ripoff, write a book about his daily classroom lectures. Please list all theories under which Professor Perini can sue Ray Ripoff. <laughs> now, you might say, why did you subject yourself to that? Why, did, why were you still on campus? And the answer was, when I sent the manuscript for 1L to Ned Chase after my first year, he had called me up and he said, um, I, I want you to remind me of something. And, uh, I said, you don't like the way this book is written. He's, he had told me to read Intern by Dr. X. He says, no, no, isn't the writing's good enough. I said, you don't like the way it's typed. Because being a student, I had a broken eye on my <laughs> typewriter that I'd never gotten fixed, and it struck between the lines and the double space. Now he says, we can read the darn thing. He says, what I need you to do is remind me, uh, why did I ever want to buy this book? So. <laughs> I, I talked him back I into it with, you know, all of these prophecies of a booming American interest in the law and law school applications had quadrupled. And even though, uh, you know, I'm sometimes referred to as the father of the legal thriller, the only moment that I ever claimed to have uh, any uh, sense of what, um, of, of what was going to happen in terms of American interest in the law was at that moment, and it was all shuck and jive. Uh, I just wanted the book published. Um, as I said, um, it was far more successful than any of us ever anticipated. Uh, and yet, um, I, I felt in some ways I had turned a key. Uh, I had written uh, fluidly um, without the sort of sense of pressure and omen that I had while I was at Stanford. Uh, and for that reason, more than any other, I decided 
I'm going to practice law. I, I think this stuff is really interesting. I wanted to do it. I'd gotten a great job as an assistant United States attorney in Chicago. Uh, and um, I, of course, thought that the one thing I'm going to do with this platform is go back to my original dream of being a novelist. And uh, my years as an AUSA were certainly the greatest in my legal career, although I've been very blessed as a lawyer to have you know, one get great case after another. But um, that, that's just one of the greatest jobs any young lawyer can have. But it's incredibly intense because you're fixed with the responsibility of being the conscience of your community. And uh, living in Chicago, it needs a big conscience. Um, <laughs> So uh, I loved the job, but I wanted to write. And so the only choice was to write every morning on the, on the, the commuter train, because that was the only time I was going to have. I had a young family by then. But I did it um, really rigorously. And throughout the time that I was working as an assistant US attorney, I thought a lot about what I was doing as a lawyer and the way it related uh, to what I'd spent the five years before law school doing, namely uh, trying to be a novelist. And uh, this was informative at a couple of levels. Uh, first, I realized that the lawyer really occupies a role, the trial lawyer anyway, very much like an author's. They're different voices. Uh, they're called witnesses. He's got to be telling a story in order to succeed. He's got to be, if you're a prosecutor, you're really trying to explain excuse me, <coughs> how you're trying to explain how evil happened. And it's got to be a compelling narrative. The big difference, though, and this was incredibly instructive uh, to me, um, were the sort of terms of address of the audience. During the years that Spear and I uh, were at Stanford, there was a raging debate from between uh, the realists led by the, the wonderful American novelist Wallace Stegner, for whom the program was named, and uh, others who fancied the new novel of the French. And, uh, excuse me, I'm going to try to clear my throat. <coughs> um, and the, 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 those who preferred the new novel um, were modernists and postmodernists who uh, really took their inspiration uh, from Ezra Pound, who remarked that the poet is the antenna of the race, and thus he will never be understood by the bullet-headed many. And this is a respectable theory that art leads culture, that art changes culture. Uh, but because it's leading culture, uh, the artist cannot be bothered that he is not understood by the bullet-headed many. Um, I found that a peculiar view uh, and finally you know, was heartened when I read Tolstoy's remark that to say that great literature can't be understood uh, by most people is equivalent to saying that great food cannot be eaten by most people. Uh, and I preferred the universals that the courtroom storytellers were able to discover. And in particular, uh, I noted the grip that the courtroom had, not simply on the lawyers, but even on the spectators. I would go up to watch when I became a supervisor in that office. Uh, and supposedly, I was there to see my, you know, the young supervisees doing their stuff. And of course, I'd go up when the critical star witness was on the stand, I couldn't tear myself away. There was something so primal in, in crime uh, that had both gripped me and brought me to it as a young prosecutor, uh, and that I realized had uh, tremendous narrative power as well. And so uh, after a few faltering starts, what I was writing on the morning commuter train uh, was a novel about uh, a prosecutor, a younger prosecutor, uh, who was ultimately investigating the murder of his former mistress. Uh, that book, Presumed Innocent, um, begins like this. This is how I always start. I am the prosecutor. I represent the state. 
I am here to present to you the evidence of a crime. Together, you will weigh this evidence. You will deliberate upon it. You will decide if it proves the defendant's guilt. This man, and here I point, you must always point, Rusty, I was told by John White. That was the day I started in the office. The sheriff took my fingerprints, the chief judge swore me in, and John White brought me up to watch the first jury trial I'd ever seen. Ned Halsey was making the opening statement for the state, and as he gestured across the courtroom, John, in his generous, avuncular way with the humid scent of alcohol on his breath at 10 in the morning, whispered my initial lesson. He was the chief deputy then, a pale Irishman with white hair, wild as corn silk. It was almost a dozen years ago, long before I had formed even the most secret ambition to hold John's job myself. If you don't have the courage to point, John White whispered, you can't expect them to have the courage to convict. And so I point. I extend my hand across the court courtroom. I hold one finger straight. I seek the defendant's eye. I say, this man has been accused. He turns away or blinks or shows nothing at all. In the beginning, I was often preoccupied, imagining how it would feel to sit there, held at the focus of scrutiny, ardently denounced before all who cared to listen, knowing that the most ordinary privileges of a decent life, common trust, personal respect, and even liberty were now like some cloak you had checked at the door and might never retrieve. I could feel the fear, the hot frustration, the haunted separateness. Now, like ore deposits, the harder stuff of duty and obligation has settled in the veins where those softer feelings moved. I have a job to do. It is not that I have grown uncaring, believe me. But this business of accusing, judging, punishing has gone on always. It is one of the great wheels turning beneath everything we do. I play my part. I am a functionary of our only universally recognized system of telling wrong from right, a bureaucrat of good and evil. This must be prohibited, not that. One would expect after all these years of making charges, trying cases, watching defendants come and go, it might have all become a jumble. Somehow, it has not. I turn back to the jury. Today, you, all of you, have taken on one of the most solemn obligations of citizenship. Your job is to find the facts, the truth. It is not an easy task, I know. Memories may fail, recollections may be shaded. The evidence might point in differing directions. You may be forced to decide about things that no one seems to know or to be willing to say. If you were at home, at work, anywhere in your daily life, you might be ready to throw up your hands. You might not want to make the effort. Here, you must. You must. Let me remind you, there was a real crime. No one will dispute that. There was a real victim, real pain. You do not have to tell us why it happened. People's motives, after all, may be forever locked inside them. But you must, at least, try to determine what actually occurred. If you cannot, we will not know if this man deserves to be freed or punished. We will have no idea who to blame. If we cannot find the truth, what is our hope of justice? So uh, I clearly had found my themes um, as a writer, uh, and uh, they continue to preoccupy me. Um, I have published now nine novels, uh, the last of them in May of 2010. Uh, Presumed Innocent really changed my life. I remember when I was um, 16 or so, I read an essay in The Atlantic by a writer named Alan, maybe it's Trachtenberg, Trachtman. He wrote Bullet, the chase movie, the movie that introduced the car chase to American <laughs> cinema. And uh, he was a lawyer in Boston when he wrote that screenplay, ironically. Uh, although at 16, that was not the part that attracted me about his story. What attracted me was that he said, I wrote Bullet and it changed my life. 
And I thought, wow, what an amazing thing to be able to create something in yourself, of yourself, that changes your life. Presumed innocent changed my life. Um, and because it had, uh, I was really reluctant uh, to uh, give heed to the many people who wanted me to write another book about Rusty Savage immediately. And I had a, a number of reasons for not wanting to do it. Uh, one, uh, of course, was that um, I didn't want to compete with myself. Um, I thought that, um, you know, you can, Euripides wisely said that you can't step in the, in the same stream twice, Ecclesiastes wisely said that you can't step in the same stream twice, and whatever was inventive about presumed innocent uh, and, uh, you know, swinging incense in myself, I can give a long-winded answer, uh, but you weren't going to invent something new that way twice. Um, and I felt that, you know, the, the, the book would be compared to what went before unfavorably. As important, you've heard that it took me a long time to become an instant success. And uh, I felt with, uh, with the success of Presumed Innocent, I wanted to try to spread my wings without being confined to the fate of the author of a series of Rusty Savage novels, much, much as I was grateful for the, for the success of the book. Um, so I waited a long time and always said, I will never do this. Uh, and then um, in 2006, I was working on a novella for, that was serialized in the New York Times Magazine. And I'd been off on book tour for the last novel that had preceded it, Ordinary Heroes. And uh, at some point when I was home sort of, you know, doing my laundry before I headed back out on the road, I had written down on a post-it note one line. A man is sitting on a bed in which the dead body of a woman lies. Now, after Innocent came out, <clears throat> people, reporters said, where'd that come from? And one day out of nowhere, I said, I think it has to do with a hopper painting. And uh, is sure enough, I then went through a book about Hopper and found a painting called An Education in Philosophy. And a man <clears throat> in an ascot is sitting fully dressed. Uh, behind him is a uh, woman uh, who is lying there um, half naked. Uh, they've, this is clearly post-coital. Uh, it hasn't done a thing for him uh, based on the absolutely abject look on his face. Uh, and somehow it's the sick nature of my imagination uh, that uh, that image became transmogrified uh, to the woman was now dead. Um, but since I knew she was dead, um, that provided great potential. Uh, one morning I looked at that post-it note and realized that the man sitting on the bed was Rusty Savage. Uh, the hero of presumed innocent. And that, of course, led to a series of questions. First, who is the woman? And that, there was sort of an instant answer for those of you who've read or seen presumed innocent. Uh, there was a kind of literary justice that Barbara, Rusty's wife in the first novel, be, be dead. Um, but then, how did she get dead? And even more significantly, what in the world are the two of them doing there? And I reread the end of Presumed Innocent, uh, and I realized that by the end of Presumed Innocent, Rusty was headed for reconciliation uh, with his wife, as incredible uh, as that might seem, because as he says throughout the novel, he wants, wants the life he had before. Uh, and uh, this is how we will get it, by forgiving all and forgetting all. Uh, but, um, knowing that he had chosen to continue that marriage, I realized exactly what this book was going to be about, which is namely how some people continue to make uh, the same mistakes. So I will read the prologue from Innocent, and I will stop. If there's time, I'll take questions. Will I have time for three more minutes, or should I quit them? Yeah. I can take a few questions. All right, let me read the prologue, and then I'll stop and take a couple questions. <laughs> 
This is told from the point of view of Rusty and Barbara's son, Nat, who's a 28-year-old man when the novel opens. A man is sitting on a bed. He is my father. The body of a woman is beneath the covers. She was my mother. This is not really where the story starts or how it ends, but it is the moment my mind returns to, the way I always see them. According to what my father will soon tell me, he has been there in that room for nearly 23 hours, except for bathroom breaks. Yesterday he awoke, as he does most weekdays, at half past six, and could see the mortal change as soon as he glanced back at my mother, just as his feet had found his slippers. He rocked her shoulder, touched her lips, he pumped the heel of his palm against her sternum a few times, but her skin was cool as clay. Her limbs were already moving in a piece, like a mannequin's. He will tell me he sat then in a chair across from her. He never cried, he thought, he will say. He does not know how long, except that the sun had moved all the way across the room when he finally stood again and began to tidy obsessively. He will say he put the three or four books she was always reading back on the shelf. He hung up the clothes she had a habit of piling on the chaise in front of her dresser, dressing mirror, then made the bed around her, pulling the sheets and blankets tight, folding the spread down evenly before laying her hands out like a doll's on the satin binding of the blanket. He threw out two of the flowers that had wilted in the vase on her bedside table and straightened the papers and magazines on her desk. He will tell me he called no one, not even the paramedics, because he was certain she was dead. He did not answer the phone, although it rang several times. Almost an entire day will have passed before he realizes he must contact me. But how can she be dead, I will ask. She was fine two nights ago when we were together. After a freighted second, I will tell my father, she didn't kill herself. No, he will agree at once. She wasn't in that kind of mood. It was her heart, he will say then. It had to be her heart and her blood pressure. Your grandfather died the same way. Are you going to call the police? The police, he will say after a time. Why would I call the police? Well, Christ, Dad, you're a judge. Isn't that what you do when someone dies suddenly? I was crying by now. I didn't know when I had started. I was going to phone the funeral home, he will tell me, but I realized you might want to see her before I did that. Well, shit, well, yes, yeah, I want to see her. As it happens, the funeral home will tell us to call our family doctor, and he, in turn, will summon the coroner who will send the police. It will become a long morning and then a longer afternoon with dozens of people moving in and out of the house. The coroner will not arrive for nearly six hours, he will be alone with my mom's body for only a minute before asking my dad's permission to make an index of all the medications she took. An hour later, I will pass my parents' bathroom and see a cop standing slack-jawed before the open medicine cabinet, a pen and pad in hand. Jesus, he will declare. Bipolar disorder, I will tell him when he finally notices me. She had to take a lot of pills. In time, he will simply sweep the shelves clean and go off with a garbage bag containing all the bottles. In the meanwhile, every so often, another police officer will arrive and ask my father about what happened. He tells the story again and again, always the same way. What was there to think about all that time, one cop will ask. My dad can have a hard way with his blue eyes, something he probably learned from his own father, a man he despised. Officer, are you married? I am, Judge. Then you know what there was to think about. Life, he will answer. Marriage. Her. The police will make him go through his account three or four more times, how he sat there and why. His response will never vary. He will answer every question in his usual contained manner. The stolid man of law who looks out on life as an endless sea. He will tell them how he moved each item, he will tell them where he spent each hour, but he will not tell anybody about the girl. Thank you all. <laughs> Questions? We don't have a lot of time. There's no time to be shy, so yes, sir. 
Yeah. Was that a, a real opening statement that you were supposed to have a few years ago? No. No, I can tell you exactly how that was written. Um, I went away with my ex-wife, and as we were leaving the house, she announced that she could not leave our infant son at home. Um, and uh, that sort of seemed to me to be contrary to the purpose of the weekend, but off we went with my son in tow, uh, and my son, who is now uh, 29 years old and a graduate student at Columbia, uh, has really always been the same way. He never liked leaving home. Uh, and so I can remember him standing in this porta crib and just shaking the thing. Uh, and, uh, you know, he was otherwise without speech, but he made a lot of noise. And uh, as you can imagine, things between my ex and I were not going particularly well at that moment. Uh, and uh, so I was sort of driven into a corner uh, and sunk into myself and wrote that down pretty much as I just read it to you. Uh, and I wrote it on uh, the uh, desk side notepad of the Kohler Resort in Kohler, Wisconsin. I had no clue where it was going to fit in the novel. And I do a lot of that, just sort of writing things down uh, because I moved to write them. And it's haphazard, works really well, though. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's where it came from. And uh, one of the things that's frightening to me um, is that, I mean, I really had no idea what that had to do with the book. Somehow I knew uh, that it was part of the book I was writing. That's all I knew. Uh, and I would tell you that I finished Presumed Innocent, and I still didn't know what it had to do with the book. And uh, if things are going well, there's a sort of inner propulsion in the book, um, then I'll figure out what it's really about only when I'm done with it. And, uh, you know, and this has to do with my theory of why there's literature, which is that, um, you know, uh, we don't need morals to stories. We need stories to capture the incredible ambivalence and ambiguity and complexity of life. And, uh, and the experience of writing, at least for me, is being caught up uh, in that maelstrom. Um, great tides of emotion. Um, but not a complete understanding, just the way I live my life, uh, of exactly what's going on until often years afterwards. So um, that, that passage ends up being emblematic of my whole writing career when I finally figured out how to touch it. And really what I learned between then and when I left Stanford was don't try to figure it out. You know, Go with it. If you feel it, write it. And that, that was the key, to feel it first and then to connect the feelings to words. So. Yes, ma'am. I am, and I don't understand what it's about. Um, <laughs> it's based on the myth of Castor and Pollux and uh, why I decided I wanted to write a book based on the Greek myths. I don't really know, except that I went out for a couple of years with a Greek woman. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that's completely the reason. Uh, and, uh, but you know, in the last two or three months, it's really started to come together. And uh, you know, I've finally reached the point, uh, I was saying to Chris on the way over here, that I don't have to find you know, the buckle on my seat belt to keep myself in my chair. Uh, my friend Rick Russo has a great saying that I love, which is that every writer experiences the same moment, which is finding his or her head inside the refrigerator and trying to figure out why they are there. <laughs> and the answer almost always is because it is the furthest place in the house from your computer. Uh, but uh, I'm past that point, and uh, there's less wandering right now. And, uh, you know, we'll see. You write it every day as a sort of an act of faith that, you know, it, it will come together 
that somebody will understand it, and perhaps that someone may even be you. So, yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, it, I think uh, one of the things I've learned is never believe a writer when she or he tells you that you know they won't do anything. Um, that there's something specific they won't do. Uh, so, uh, you know, because I had my experience with Professor Perini, uh, I said I would never write about you know, the experiences I'd had as a practicing lawyer. Uh, but by the time I got to my fourth or fifth novel, I felt enough confidence about the fact that no matter what real world materials I was starting with, they would transform and become something of their own. And so I did go back to what had been uh, certainly the most dramatic part of my years as a prosecutor when I was involved in the investigation and prosecution of a number of corrupt judges. Uh, when I was a boy, uh, I was very close with my grandfather. And I, didn't, I wasn't close with him initially, but when I got to 13, uh, I got the measles. Uh, and uh, my grandfather sat with me in the dark uh, and told me the story of his life. Uh, and it went on for days. It was, you know, wonderful. And I suspect that will soon find its way into a novel. But um, one of the things he told me uh, was about getting swindled. Uh, he bought a gas station uh, down on Ohio Street in Chicago, only to find days after he took the deed uh, that it was scheduled for condemnation. Uh, and uh, that is in the book. And. Uh, I had said to my grandfather, Grandpa, why didn't you sue? And he said to me, a poor man like me, I can't afford to buy a judge. Uh, and that was, that was his idea of justice in Chicago. So when I became a prosecutor, uh, one of my dreams was to do, to do something about that. And, uh, but Personal Injuries, the book that grew out of that experience, is really full of uh, all of my ambivalence about being a prosecutor and, um, you know, what I learned uh, about um, the people that I, you know, sent to the penitentiary, some of whom I ended up liking a lot um, and uh, even admiring it sometimes, you know. Uh, one of the things about criminality that goes unrecognized is criminal behavior is one of the great expressions of human imagination. Uh, it really is. You want to talk about thinking outside the box? They got it. They end up in the box, but they start out outside the box. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it began with, with known materials and turned into something else. So, and I hope you enjoy it to the end. Anyway, I think I've exhausted my time limit. Thank you all for being here. Again, I salute you for coming out in the rain. Thank you very much.